In this section of our lecture, we are going to study one of the most fundamental and yet sometimes misunderstood systems in orthopedic trauma, the Lauge Hansen classification of ankle fractures. This system is not merely descriptive, it attempts to explain fractures based on the mechanism of injury, that is, the position of the foot at the moment of trauma and the direction of the force applied. Understanding Lauge Hansen is essential because it links anatomy, biomechanics, radiology, and clinical decision making in a way that no other classification does. Let us begin with the basic concept. Lauge Hansen describes two elements. First, the position of the foot at the time of injury, either supination or pronation. Second, the direction of the deforming force, which may be external rotation abduction, or adduction. By combining these two variables, we obtain four major categories of ankle fractures. Supination external rotation, abbreviated SER, supination adduction, abbreviated SA, pronation external rotation, abbreviated PER, and pronation abduction, abbreviated PA. Each mechanism produces a characteristic pattern of injury, progressing through predictable stages. The radiographic findings we see are therefore not random, but rather logical results of the sequence of ligamentous ruptures and bone fractures caused by these forces. Let us now examine each mechanism in turn. Supination external rotation, SER. The most common ankle fracture pattern is the supination external rotation mechanism. In this injury, the foot is in supination and an external rotational force is applied. The sequence of damage follows four stages. In stage one, the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, or AITFL, is torn. Radiographically, this may be subtle, but stress views may reveal widening of the syndesmosis. In stage two, the force propagates to the lateral malleolus, producing a low transverse or oblique fracture of the fibula at the level of the syndesmosis. This is sometimes referred to as a Weber B fracture, located at the level of the plafond. In stage three, the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament is torn, or the posterior malleolus is fractured. And finally, in stage four, the deltoid ligament on the medial side is ruptured or the medial malleolus is fractured transversely. Thus, the full SER injury involves both malleoli and the syndesmosis, creating an unstable bimolellar or trimolellar fracture. Clinically, this mechanism is common in sports and twisting injuries, and understanding the sequence allows us to recognize that if we see a Weber B fibular fracture, we must carefully examine the posterior malleolus and medial structures for associated injury. Supination adduction, SA. The second pattern is supination adduction. Here, the foot is in supination and an adduction force acts medially. The sequence has two stages. In stage one, there is rupture of the lateral collateral ligaments or more commonly a transverse fracture of the lateral malleolus at or below the level of the syndesmosis. This is sometimes referred to as a Weber A fracture. In stage two, the vertical load is transferred to the medial side, producing a vertical or oblique fracture of the medial malleolus. This vertical orientation is characteristic and must be distinguished from the transverse fractures seen in external rotation injuries. Clinically, Supination adduction injuries are less common, but they are important to recognize because the vertical medial malleolus fracture often extends into the plafond, making the injury more unstable and more likely to require surgical fixation. Pronation external rotation, PER. The third pattern is pronation external rotation. In this injury, the foot is pronated and an external rotational force is applied. This is also a very common mechanism, particularly in higher energy trauma. The sequence again progresses through four stages. In stage one, the medial side is injured first, either through rupture of the deltoid ligament 
or a transverse fracture of the medial malleolus, in stage 2, the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament is torn. In stage 3, the fibula fractures obliquely, but importantly, the fracture occurs above the level of the syndesmosis. This is a Weber C fracture, high above the plafond, reflecting disruption of the syndesmotic complex. And finally, in stage 4, the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament is torn or the posterior malleolus is fractured. Thus, the complete PER injury results in a trimalleolar fracture pattern with syndesmotic disruption. Clinically, these injuries are unstable and usually require operative fixation with syndesmotic screws or flexible devices. Pronation abduction, PA. The fourth and final major pattern is pronation abduction. In this case, the foot is pronated and a strong abduction force acts laterally. In stage one, the medial side is injured first, either through deltoid ligament rupture or transverse fracture of the medial malleolus. In stage two, the syndesmosis is injured, including tearing of the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. In stage three, the fibula fractures transversely or comminutes, often at the level of the syndesmosis. Clinically, pronation abduction injuries produce widening of the ankle mortis and instability of the talus within the mortis. The transverse or comminuted fibular fracture, along with medial injury, make these patterns highly unstable, and operative treatment is generally required. Clinical relevance. Now that we have reviewed these four mechanisms, let us consider their clinical relevance. First, Lauge Hansen helps us to predict associated injuries. For example, if we see a Weber C fibular fracture, we know it likely corresponds to a pronation external rotation injury, and therefore, we must carefully check the medial malleolus and posterior malleolus for associated damage. Second, it helps us understand why ligamentous injuries and fracture patterns coexist. And third, it guides treatment because instability of the mortise must always be corrected, whether through cast immobilization in stable injuries or through open reduction and internal fixation in unstable or displaced injuries. Restoring the congruence of the ankle mortise is absolutely critical because incongruence, even by a millimeter or two, significantly increases the risk of post-traumatic arthritis. Syndesmotic injuries require fixation with screws or flexible devices, and stress radiographs or intraoperative stress testing may be necessary to confirm stability. Complications of ankle fractures include post-traumatic arthritis, malunion, nonunion, chronic pain, instability, and reflex sympathetic dystrophy. This is why understanding the mechanism of injury, evaluating stability, and restoring alignment are so important. Conclusion To conclude, the Lauge Hansen classification of ankle fractures is not just a theoretical system. It's a practical tool that links mechanism, anatomy, radiology, and treatment. By analyzing whether the foot was in supination or pronation, and whether the force was external rotation, abduction, or adduction, we can predict the sequence of injury, classify the fracture accurately, and plan appropriate treatment. This is why the system continues to be taught and tested in examinations, and why it remains relevant in clinical practice today. Because in trauma care, to treat the patient properly, we must first understand not only what has broken, but how it broke.